Thank you, Luis. And the chairman of the Travis County GOP, Matt McCowiak, is joining us now. And Matt, thank you so much for being with us. Great to, great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, you know, Matt, the race is getting probably the most attention this Super Tuesday. Aren't on the Republican ticket. You know, they're on the Democratic ticket, but we still want to get you to weigh in, starting with the presidential race. We've just heard in now that former Vice President Joe Biden is projected to also win Alabama tonight. Uh, you know, S Senator Bernie Sanders had a lot of fire going in tonight in those previous caucuses and primaries, but obviously Biden being able to pick up. What are your thoughts on the Democratic race for president? You're going to see a split result tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to see, I think, Sanders win eight, seven or eight states. You're going to see Biden, I think, win as many as five states, all southern states. He's already won Virginia, it appears, based on projections, North Carolina and then Alabama, based on what you just said. I think he could also win Arkansas and Oklahoma. And then, of course, Texas is a jump ball. I, I personally, and I'm not an expert the Democrats. I'll admit that. But I, I would say I think Sanders is more likely to win Texas. The reason I say that is with more than half of the early vote in, Biden's surge didn't start till the early vote ended. And so he'd have to win 60, 65, 70 percent of the election day vote in order to have that counterbalance, probably a weaker performance during the during the early vote period. He'd have to do better on election day, far better than he did during the early vote. So we'll see. But look, it's going to be a split vote. Sanders is going to win California. I think he's going to win Texas. He's going to win a lot of Western states. Uh, he's going to rack up a delegate lead tonight, uh, whether it's 100 delegates or 200 delegates somewhere in that range. Uh, the larger that lead, the harder it's going to be for Biden to overtake him and get into first place heading into the convention in Milwaukee. I'm actually really surprised to hear you said that you think Sanders is going to win tonight. And so do you think Bloomberg is just not a factor in Texas? Yeah. Uh, so look, I, there, there's always the question of, of whether you're viable. Uh, and in certain states, you have to be at 15 percent. I think Bloomberg will be at 15 percent in a lot of congressional districts. But he's not going to win one state tonight. I would wager a pretty solid amount of money. That's that, that's not going to happen. Uh, he is going to collect some delegates in California and Texas. Uh, he's made a play for Oklahoma. He's made play in, in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see if he's able to pull some delegates out of those places. He might even be in third place in delegates after tonight. But he's going to be so far behind Biden and particularly Sanders that I honestly think Bloomberg may not be in this race by the end of the week. Uh, whether he wants to keep going to March 10th and March 17th when you have some other big states, including Florida, remains to be seen. But he spent $500 million all on tonight. Yeah. It's been entirely about Super Tuesday. If he comes away not having won one state and being in a distant third to the top two candidates, he does not want to be uh, blamed uh, and responsible for Bernie Sanders being the nominee. So I, I want to ask you this. Who do the Republicans want to see on the ticket going against President Donald Trump? Bernie Sanders, no question. Um, you know, from my standpoint, I see his views being well outside the mainstream. Um, and I think, you know, given that he calls himself a democratic socialist, it allows Republicans to call him a socialist and have it be factual, mm -hmm. uh, entirely factual. Uh, I just think Bernie Sanders is well outside the mainstream in the country. I think he gives Republicans a chance to win the suburbs back. Uh, he has a number of positions that are really problematic with the electorate. Shutting down fracking on day one might be something the far left wants. It's not something Texas wants. It's not something Western Pennsylvania wants. Right. It's not something Ohio wants. Uh, Medicare for all, again, far left wants that. You're talking about taking 160 million people, taking them away from their health plans, many of whom are union members, labor union members who negotiated their health care plans. So we'll see. Bernie has a message. He has a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, he, I think, is going to be in first place by the time they get to Milwaukee. The question is, how close does he get to 50 percent? Can he somehow uh, survive Milwaukee? I do think the Democratic Party is going to deny him the nomination and Biden will be the nominee. Wow. Well, Matt, I, I also want you to weigh in a little bit on the Senate race because there are 12 Democrats that are dying to take on John Cornyn. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I would say, look, there's some some perfectly nice and decent people running. I don't think any of them really are serious statewide candidates. Uh, well, it's going to remain to be seen, but you really had three Democrats who could have been first-tier statewide candidates who decided not to run. Beto O'Rourke, Julian Castro, Joaquin Castro. None of them wanted to run against John Cornyn, and I don't believe any of them wanted to run a presidential year. Uh, tonight, we're going to see MJ Hager likely finish first. Uh, she raised the most money. She has the most establishment support. Um, and then second place, I think, is down to Royce West, the current state senator in, from Dallas, and Christina Simpson Ramirez, who's a progressive activist who's had some outside, outside money and some energy. Um, I think West, I'm going to predict that West gets in the runoff. He has Dallas geographically entirely to himself. Mm -hmm. I think that's a real advantage. Ramirez does, again, kind of like Bernie, have a message. He's very progressive. She has a lot of intensity. Primaries are about intensity. They're about enthusiasm. Uh, so there's a good chance she gets in there. I think that, that the second, third, fourth place fi you know, finishers on the Democratic side are going to be really close to each other. So MJ Hager may be in the you know, mid to late, mid to high 20s, and then the rest of them in the you know, high teens, something like that. But they're going to go to a runoff. It goes to late May. 
Meanwhile, Cornyn has $12 million in the bank, it would be $15 million by then, maybe $18 million by then, and he's running a very, very serious uh, professional re-election campaign, putting himself in a really strong position. So do you think that's a big disadvantage for the Democrats regardless? Huge. Um, I think the Democrats made a terrible mistake not trying to control how many candidates were running in their primary. A primary runoff delays them from unifying the party, it delays them from raising general election funds. You know, by June, you've got four months to go out and raise 20 to $30 million to run a serious general election campaign against Cornyn. He has a year and a half head start. He's going to have a $15 million head start. He will have his research done on both of the both of the candidates who are in the runoff, ready to go, ready to go after them the morning after one of them is the nominee. It's just, it's a real problem. It's a big state. It's a huge challenge. Uh, these candidates are starting to understand how big the state is. When you're not a statewide official, you do not understand how big Texas is. 20 distinct media markets with at least one local newspaper and one local television station. $1.8 million is the cost to run saturation level statewide television for one week. Right? So you can chew up $10 million in one month just on television, and that's not enough to run a winning campaign. So it's, it's an immense challenge for the Democrats to unify in late May and, and put their candidate forward and try to make them truly competitive with Cornyn. You know, to be fair, Cornyn does have some challengers, though he is obviously projected to win. Anything you want to say about the, the, the other Republicans in that race? No, not really. Um, I, I, only one of them, I think, is someone that even someone like me who follows this closely even knows the name of. Mm -hmm. And he's a conservative activist, been a Second Amendment activist named Dwayne Stovall, kind of an irritant at, at, at times. Uh, he's like he's been sort of picking away at, at Cornyn for some time, but Cornyn's going to win with a huge margin tonight, well over 60 percent, maybe well over 65 uh, percent. Yeah, the Republican Party is really unified behind him. And let me just say about Cornyn: Cornyn cares about the party. He wants to win by the absolute largest margin to help Republican candidates down ballot. He's the kind of person that helps county parties and the state party and Republican women's groups and gets around the state and speaks in front of Republican groups. He cares a lot about this. He does not want a 2.7 percent victory like Cruz had two years ago. And so he decided to run again because he's very afraid uh, of Texas going blue and he wants to be part of keeping Texas red. And it is not a bumper sticker for him. It is absolutely core to his being. So we're excited to, to be with him tonight here in a little bit at County Line on the Hill. We'll have our election night party, which he'll be attending. So we'll have hundreds of people there celebrating. Yeah, we'll have a live crew there as well. We're going to check yes, in with them a little will. bit later. You know, there is a big race, though, on the Republican ticket, and that is for a state house seat. Uh, state Representative Vicki Goodwin, District 47, she flipped that seat. Uh, in 2018, Republicans hoping to take it back. Yeah, and that was uh, one of those seats that flipped with the Beto wave. Uh, you know, in 2018, you had a really unique uh, mix of factors, right? You had Beto, who was a phenomenon at the time, who raised $80 million and spent $78.5 million of it in Texas. Uh, he brought a million new voters out, and that combined with straight ticket voting in such a way that it did lead to flipping districts. The Democrats took 12 state house seats back uh, in, in 2018, and this was one of them. Uh, and the, the margin was 3,000 raw votes, okay, so it was not a close race. Uh, I do believe Vicki Goodwin's very beatable. We have five really strong Republican candidates in House District 47. Uh, we will see who gets in the runoff. I, I've, I, I'll be honest with you, I've talked to so many people in that district over the last week. Predictions are all over the map. Don Zimmerman, a former council member, is probably the best known when this thing started. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people think he's probably going to be in the runoff. There's a chance he could finish third and miss the runoff. It's entirely possible. You've got four really good candidates, two women, three men. One's a police officer, one's a lawyer and former Marine. Um, Don Zimmerman was on the city council. has been a taxpayer champion for years. You have uh, an activist for education issues and Jennifer Fleck. And then Jenny Rowan Forgy, a local lawyer who's worked at the Capitol and has done really well with fundraising. Five really strong candidates. So we're excited to see. We're not going to have a nominee. We're going to go into runoff. So the same issues that, that, that battle the Democrats on the U.S. Right. Senate side are going to uh, create challenges for us in the House District 47 race. But it's a winnable seat, and we need to take it back. I, I do want to, I'm sorry, I know you want to ask him a question. Oh, I just want to I just want to push back on, on District 47. How important is it when the House, the Democrats are nine seats away? from flipping the House. How yeah. important is it that the Republican Party take this seat back if you guys want to maintain power and control of it? It's House? a great question and it's one actually that, that a lot of people haven't focused on and, and the, reason, the reason is the best way to prevent the minority party from taking the majority in any legislative body is whatever their, their magic number is, is to increase that number, right? I mean, think about how hard or, or it may be to take nine out of 150 seats uh, net in 2020 to take the House back. If you increase that to 11 or 12 or 13, which I think we will do, I think we're going to flip a seat in Hayes County. I think we're going to flip the seat in Travis. We may mm -hmm. flip one or two in Houston or Dallas. That's a much tougher thing. They, they flipped 12 seats in 2018. 
and now they just need nine. And so, yeah, if you take a few back, you make it harder. You, you make them have to go after more seats. You have to make them have to go over a wider map. That's more expensive. It's more challenging. Uh, there are more variables. So, yeah, we, need, we absolutely need to take 47 back, particularly since we're going into redistricting. They're going to redraw the maps, and that seat, I think, is likely going to be either a Democrat seat or a Republican seat for 10 years because of whoever wins in November. All right. Okay, Quita, now your real question. Quick, <laughs> real quick, I want to ask you a little bit about voter turnout because this mm -hmm. election really seems to be resonating with people a lot of Democrats especially coming out going to the polls this time around. Yeah, and I think we can we can over interpret how primary turnout looks for one party versus the other. It's almost always driven by where the competitive races are. Mm -hmm. And when you look at competitive races, the single thing that matters most in presidential cycles is the presidential race. The Democrats have a large field. You have massive spending from Bloomberg, but also to, to a certain extent from Biden and, and Warren and Steyer and others in Texas who've been spending for weeks, if not months. That is why the Democratic turnout is really, really high. We will see how it looks today. Uh, certainly, they're going to outvote us here in Travis County by a three to one, four to one margin. That's absolutely the case. Uh, but we'll see what the overall numbers look like. I wouldn't say that that tells us too much about the fall. Most people don't vote in primaries. Most people don't even know primaries are going on, don't think it affects them. They make a decision in the fall once they know who the two nominees are. So we're seeing a very small percentage of Texans vote tonight. It, it matters, it's important. Uh, it, it determines who the choices are that voters have in front of them, but most people are not voting and not paying attention. So general elections and primaries are very different. All right. Well, Matt, we thank you so much for taking some time to join us Thanks. tonight. And guys, in about 30 minutes,